Welcome to the Wealth Evolution Club podcast. Our mission is to help you evolve from rich to wealthy and create a life of freedom that's not dependent on a paycheck. Here is your host, investor, entrepreneur, and an influencer, Dr. Mitu Bhatnagar, CCIM. Hello, Wealth Nation. You are listening to the Wealth Evolution Club podcast. Our club shares the success stories, explores various loopholes, secrets, and skills that help you evolve from rich to wealthy. You might be wondering, why rich is not wealthy? That's because that fat income or paycheck is gone in paying mortgage of luxury homes, luxury cars, high taxes, and paying credit card bills to maintain the affluent lifestyle. You are working so hard for money and hardly have freedom to do what you enjoy the most. For example, spending time with your loved ones, going on vacation, or anything else that you cherish. After all, being rich is not about monetary wealth. It's about being truly satisfied, being truly happy, and having a balanced professional personal and social life, being contented with what you have and not worrying about work, future or how to earn more to save more for retirement. Our podcast mission is to create a spark, help you evolve from rich to wealthy and inspire you to live a life filled with freedom, fun and fulfillment. Wealth Nation, please make sure to like our page Wealth Evolution Club and join our free Facebook community, Wealth Evolution Club. Good morning, Jean. Welcome to Wealth Evolution Club. How are you doing today? I'm fine, Mito. Thank you. Thanks for having me. Thank you, Jean, for allowing us an opportunity to host you as a VIP guest launch series of Wealth Evolution Club. We are really honored to have you. Well, that's great. I wish your uh, I wish your club and your podcast all the success in the world. I'm happy to be part of a part of it in its early days. Yeah. So let's talk about you. We will uh, love to know about your background. Could you please share it with our speakers? I'm the founding partner of a couple of, of legal partnerships. The current partnership is called Trowbridge Law Group, and one of the things I bring to the table, me too, is I was a syndicator. My career has really had three parts, a commercial broker and a real estate syndicator and a lawyer. I actually went to law school at 45 to become a uh, securities lawyer. As you know, I was a CCIM instructor for 40 years, if you can believe it, retiring from that position uh, uh, two years ago, just just too busy to to do that. And I wrote a book that uh, sells an awful lot on syndication. So that's, uh, that's me. Sounds great. Very impressive. So, you know, we're going to talk about syndication. And just quickly, I wanted to show you how big the syndication market is. Now, this is just private placements. In the 12-month period that the the last SEC um, documentation is available to us, there is $1.8 trillion raised in private placements. And that's about six times the amount of money that was raised on the New York Stock Exchange on initial public offerings during the same period of time. So it's big business. One of the things that we'll talk about quickly is that if you get get down to where it says 1.4 trillion is raised in 506B, mm-hmm. a 210 billion in 506C, but 99% of all this money is raised in rule 506, which we're going to talk about. So this is the business world. This is where all small businesses raise their money. Certainly only a fraction of this money is in real estate, but this is where you will work if you're going to uh, raise money from other people to do real estate. Just a question, Jean, because some of our listeners are brand new into the syndication world. So we will appreciate if you can please cover 506B and 506C, what it is. We will. We're going to get there in just a few seconds. Let's, uh, let's, Let's see this slide. This slide shows a picture of how a lot of your 
clients and your members would start their real estate investing career, kind of like I did and maybe like you did. I formed an uh, something that I called Investment LLC. It wasn't, it was called uh, West 7th Street LLC. And uh, I was the member. I okay. funded that with my money and I bought a property. Okay. Okay. So the LLC owns the property and I just own interest in the LLC. Okay. Now, as I moved on my career and as you're moving in your career in syndication, um, how every syndicator gets started is we ran out of enough money to buy yeah. all the real estate we want to run ourselves. So we okay. have to go out and get multiple members. So if there's more than one investor, what is it? It's a syndication. Okay. That's a, that's a crazy word. Everyone wants to know, well, what's a syndication? It's two or more people uh, okay. pooling their resources to do some business uh, business activity. A lot of things we do in life are syndications. The biggest example is watching movies at the beginning of the movie. It'll show you four or five companies that pool their money and their resources to make a movie. And that's that's a syndication. The real question is, does it get into the securities law? The reason it goes into the securities is because there's something called the manager. When you get multiple investors, someone has to run it. We have the members mm -hmm. investing their money in investment LLC, whatever that is, anticipating a profit. Okay. But the results of this are going to be, the results of this activity are going to be resting on the shoulders of the manager. Okay. So, so that's actually what the securities law says. It says when there's investment of money mm -hmm. in a common enterprise with the okay. expectation of profit. Okay. Due to a third party, due to someone who's active and everyone else is passive. Okay. It's a security. And the government has an interest in protecting the investors. So you might ask, well, who does the securities laws protect? Uh, the securities laws are designed to protect the members. And so the securities laws protect the public in two ways. Number one, it requires full disclosure. That's why we have a private placement memorandum. That's why we put all the documents in writing because the securities laws require that every investor gets all the material facts ahead of time before they invest so they can make an informed decision. And then it also protects the public from people who should not be selling uh, securities. So that's in the in the stock market world, the brokerage community where you have to have a license Mm -hmm. to sell securities. With, with what we do, no one needs to have a license because just like in real estate, mm -hmm. there's for sale by owner. Okay. You, don't, you don't need a license if you're selling your own real estate. In the securities law, you don't need a license if you're selling your own securities and you're called an issuer. So it's called the issuer exemption. And so as I said, um, an investment contract is a security and the, the case that talks about what an investment contract is. If you read anything about securities laws, you'll read about the Howey case, which was actually a real estate case. And in this case, people were investing money mm -hmm. in a common enterprise. They expected to get a profit and the profit was going to happen from a company called Howey. And uh, that all went all the way to the Supreme Court. And the Supreme Court has used those four, they're called prongs, those four prongs of a test mm -hmm. to see what's happening, to see if it's a security. And the most important thing is always the last one. There are all sorts of ways you can invest money in a common enterprise and expect a profit. You can do that yourself, mm -hmm. right? You can do yep. that with two people if everyone is making a unanimous decision. But the minute the manager steps in, okay. as we saw in that picture, we are in a security. So when we're in a security, there's all sorts of things to do. Here comes Regulation D. The magic of Regulation D is that the offerings are exempt from full registration with the SEC. All we do is file an information document called a Form D. This is where the 
$1.8 trillion is raised in exempt private placements, and 99% was uh, raised in Regulation D. So here's the breakdown of what's happening in Regulation D today. I'm going to throw a little history in it. Until 1981, there was just uh, raising money, and there weren't a lot of great rules for it. But 1981, Congress passed uh, an amendment to the securities law that created Rule 506. You'll see something that's called 506B. Well, when I was raising money, it was just 506. We could raise all the money we wanted. We could raise money from an unlimited number of accredited investors, and I'll define that in a minute. Uh, The investors were known to us because we couldn't advertise. So all the investors had to do was check a box and self-certify that they met the definition of accredited. And in addition, we could have 35 people who were not accredited, did not meet the dollar and cent definition of accredited, but were smart, could read the documents and understand what was going on. We called them sophisticated. And you got to have a PPM. Mm -hmm. We always knew that. And no advertising or solicitation. So there I was raising money when I was syndicating. I was building storage facilities, me too. And um, I I could raise as much money as I wanted from all the uh, accredited investors I could find. The problem is I couldn't find very many because I couldn't advertise. Mm -hmm. And, you know, they couldn't find me. So in 2012, Congress came along and said, you know, these smart investors, these accredited investors, let's let Gene advertise to accredited investors. And let's let them find Gene and let's let's open up capital formation. Let's promote capital formation by letting all the genes in the world find all the accredited investors there are and uh, raise some money. So they created 506C. And in 506C, it's basically the same as 506B, except I can advertise. I can't have sophisticated investors at all because I don't know them. And because I don't know the the, uh, accredited investors, we have to go through some sort of a third-party verification so I can be reasonably assured, not guaranteed, but Mm -hmm. reasonably assured that they're accredited. But I want us to go back to one of the first slides I had. 99% of the money is raised in 506, but... 1.4 1.4 trillion is raised in 506B. Okay. And 210 million is raised in uh, uh, 210 billion, excuse me, is raised in 506C. So even today, seven years after the creation of 506C, most of the money and most of what your investors are going to invest in will be 506B, where you know the sponsor and the sponsor knows you. You have a pre-existing relation with the sponsor. That's where all the money is raised. And why my business, well, my business is all Rule 506. Um, the majority of the business is in 506B. Gene, what is pre-existing relationship and what is the requirement? Like how long should I know the investors? Okay. How many times should mm-hmm. I have met them to quant? Uh, well, quality? there's there's a, there's a topic for a whole nother day, but okay. uh, briefly pre-existing would be that you know the person prior to contemplating your offering. If you don't have an offering on the street today, you Mm -hmm. can be talking to as many people as you want. You can be putting them in your database. But the minute you hire an attorney to draft your operating agreement, you Mm -hmm. are contemplating an offering. And your my analogy is your database freezes. Okay. Everyone who's in your database prior to that Okay. pre-existing and you can talk to them, but there's two parts. That's why it's a longer conversation. It's pre-existence, pre-existing and substantive. Mm -hmm. You have to know whether they're accredited, whether they're sophisticated, what's their education level. Can they read the documents about your offering and understand it? I mean, if we're doing uh, an apartment building that's 
something totally different than if we're doing uh, solar energy panels with all sorts of tax advantages. Those two documents are totally different. So sophisticated means different things and miss different offerings. You're listening to the Wealth Evolution Club podcast. Stay tuned to evolve from rich to wealthy and create a life of freedom that's not dependent on a paycheck. You're highly educated, work long hours, earn exceptionally good money, yet you have no freedom, fun, or fulfillment. Most of your paycheck is going to high taxes, big mortgages, and big credit card payments to maintain an affluent lifestyle. But what happens if you're unable to work due to an injury? Will you be able to keep up with the payments? And will you ever be able to comfortably retire? We want to help you live a life of financial freedom. Visit WealthEvolutionClub.com to learn more and get the free book, DNA of Wealth. So what are international investors? Can they invest in syndication in U.S.? What's important for foreign investors to know before investing in any syndication? Briefly. (laughs) A foreign investor would be one who either the individual or the entity does not have a U.S. tax ID number. Okay. That's as simple as I can make that. Mm -hmm. Um, If you have a U.S. tax ID number, then um, you probably have, have a bank account. Mm -hmm. Okay. And so the money that you have to invest has gone into this federal bank, like U.S. Bank or Chase or Bank of America, and they've done all the testing. They've tested whether you're on the, uh, you know, the do not invest list because you're a terrorist. They've, They've talked about what country you're from. There are certain countries where we don't encourage investors. They've uh, traced the money and made sure it isn't drug money. Okay. Okay. Mm-hmm. If someone, me too, if someone walked up to you with a grocery bag with $100,000 and they said they were from some foreign country and you asked them if they had a tax ID number and they said, no, do not take their money. Okay. Walk That's them right true. down to the bank. Okay. <laughs> have them open your bank account. Have them get a tax ID number. Have the bank go through all the testing all the procedures, then when they come to you and invest, they write a check out of their LLC or their corporation, depending upon what they need to have for their home country and invest with you. So yes, we can have foreign investors. In fact, we have certain offerings that are nothing but foreign investors, me too. That's called a Regulation S as in, and as in Sam, a Regulation S offering. And a lot of the rules we've talked about don't apply, mm-hmm. okay, uh, because the people are uh, not U.S. citizens. So, okay. yes, you can, you can do that. Okay, and when we are, like you said, like if they are coming with a bag of money, now if I have someone local who is coming, like who is a citizen or maybe a resident here, uh, if they come with the cash, can I accept that cash or does it have to go through the bank? I would never accept the cash. Okay. No matter what, even if it was me. Okay. You know, how do you know it's not, I'm not uh, uh, laundering money? Absolutely. You okay. need to, you need mm-hmm. to do that. Now, if anyone, see, the real issue is, do they have a tax ID number? And number okay. two, Don't accept cash. And then you may very well have withholding Mm -hmm. information, but your CPA will tell you about the withholding information, which is different between different countries because of tax treaties and all that. That's really a complicated area. And uh, I know you mentioned to me that you may have uh, investors coming from a foreign country. Well, they know, more than likely, investors who want to invest in the United States know how to get their money here. They probably already have their entity. Uh, okay. They can deposit their money and they can invest with you. And that's great. Okay. What is the difference between return on capital versus the Ooh. return off capital? Sure. The best example I can give is if you go to the bank and let's say you put $10,000 in a savings account. Okay. And it's going to pay you uh, 10% interest just for ease. When you go at the end of the year, there should be $100,000 of interest in your savings account, right? Okay. Yep. You should have 10,000 
uh, $100,000. Sure. Um, I don't know if my math is right, but you should have that interest. And if you take that interest out of your account, what you took was money that you earned on your investment and you still have $10,000 in the bank. Wow, that's very simple. Okay. Thank but you. Let's say you take $200,000 out. Mm -hmm. You've taken all you've taken your return on your money and you've also dipped in your principal and taken a return of your money. So you only had uh, $9,000 left or whatever it is starting the next next year. Sorry for my math. But in real estate, how this applies, if I'm I'm investing and you're the sponsor, me too, and Mm -hmm. at the end of the year, you look at how much money the property made, Mm-hmm. The money the property makes is like the interest. So okay. send me a distribution with the interest. Okay. If you're going to send me some of my own money back, which mm-hmm. happens, you better tell me it's my own money. Okay. And you better not tell me that, you know, this is a, a cash on cash return when all you're doing is sending me my own money. I'm going to do a podcast in the next week. There are people out there breaking the law all the time. They they raise, in their initial raise, they raise extra money and they put it in a savings account. And then they use that money to make distributions every quarter. Mm -hmm. But they don't tell the investor that all they're doing is giving the investor their money back. They tell the investor, you've earned 6%, 10%. That's fraud. Yep. You'll go to jail for that. You okay. cannot do that. It sounds like me like, could it be like a commingling of funds like we have in real estate? Is it like something similar to that? Well, it's, 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 it's not really commingling because you don't take control of it. You just have the money and then you send the money back to the investor and okay. you tell them it's a return. You know, if you tell them this is part of your IRR, if you tell them this is um, a cash on cash would even be better. If you okay. tell them this is a cash on cash distribution, it better come from earnings, not from a return of capital. So that's very problematic today. And I know people all over, uh, not people who hire me to do their legal work, but other people who do that. And they say, well, the investors like to get a check. Well, I wonder if the investors know that it's just getting their money back. So I could go on and on forever. Let's talk about accredited investors. Okay, sure. An accredited investor for since 81 has been a person with a million dollars of net worth or a household with a million dollars of net worth. Okay. Or a person who has um, $200,000 of annual income and files an individual tax return, or okay. a household that has $300,000 of annual income and files jointly. Now, okay. that's been the rule forever. Okay. On December 8th, that rule was slightly modified. And it was modified to take into consideration some other factors. The million the 200 and the 300,000 stays the same. But now there's a group of people who don't have to meet that definition, that dollar and cent definition. And the group is stockbrokers, people who are licensed to sell securities because of their training, their background, and whatever are now deemed accredited regardless of their net worth. So a series 7, 65, and 82, they are accredited investors. The next thing uh, that we did, that the SEC did, is that there are households where the two people aren't married. Okay. And they, and they don't file a joint tax return, but they are uh, substantially a household. So in that case, the two people can add their income and their net worth together and qualify as uh, accredited. That's pretty cool. Wow, that's cool. Then um, entities that are formed that have $5 million of assets are accredited. 
And that's really important for family offices because in family offices, there are a lot of members and not everyone individually is accredited. But the entity, if it has $5 million of assets, is treated as one investor and it's treated as accredited. And you don't have to worry about who's a member of the uh, uh, the family office. And the last thing they did, and this has affected some of my clients positively, is um, key employees of the sponsor are now accredited regardless of their dollar and cent net worth. It's always been that the manager mm-hmm. and uh, the director um, of the manager LLC are accredited by definition, but the employees aren't. So I have one lady who does all the financial analysis for a company that, well, I've done over a hundred offerings with them, but she could never invest because they only take accredited investors and she's not accredited, but now she can start investing in their own deal. So all that happened right before Christmas. And that's, that's pretty exciting. Uh, Me too. Christmas grief. So I have one question here. So, you know, like my property manager, like with this new definition, she can be accredited, but she is not my direct employee because she is employee of my property manager. That won't qualify. That, will that not won't qualify, qualify for her, no. Okay. Sounds great. Um, yeah, there are 16 million households in the United States okay. that after this change, wow. the Congress believes are accredited. So there's a lot of investors out there and uh, who are accredited. And that's good because in 506B, you can take as many accredited investors as you want, but you still have to have that pre-existing relationship. Sounds great. Thank you so much, Gene. We appreciate you coming here and sharing this uh, information with us. Now, if one of our listeners want to reach out to you, what's the best method to reach? Could you please share your information? Yeah, right here on the screen. Mm -hmm. Um, My direct email is gene at Trowbridge Law Group. The website is Trowbridge Law Group. And one of the things we do that are kind, kind of fun, we have a program called TLG Talks, which stands for Trowbridge Law Group. And those are interviews. I've interviewed 16 people that are either in the business, don't want to be in the business, or are getting started from my rookie camp. And every Thursday at 12.30, we, uh, 12.30 um, or 12 o'clock, excuse me, Pacific time, we play one of those half hour interviews and put them on YouTube. A lot of interesting, uh, interesting people and some interesting thoughts from uh, from the syndication world. So I would suggest that uh, people who want to learn a little bit more about that go to my YouTube channel, Trowbridge Law. Thanks again. Thank you, Gene. Thank you, Wealth Nation. See you next time. Until then, live a life that is filled with freedom, fun, and fulfillment. Thank you. Have a wonderful day. This has been the Welcome to the Wealth Evolution Club podcast. If you're a doctor, medical professional, engineer, CEO, or other elite professional, we want to help you live a life of financial freedom. Visit WealthEvolutionClub.com to learn more and get the free book, DNA of Wealth. 